Good day, grade 12s. My name is Kaden Mazokere. I'm the author of the Distinction Bound Student Textbooks. I have Economics grade 10, 11, and 12, and Business Studies grade 11 and 12. All right, um, in this lesson, I'm going to do uh, in exam prep insurance. Right, insurance is one of the five topics uh, under business ventures. And so if you're going for business ventures, yes, you need to watch this video um, along with the other four topics. Uh, there is insurance, there is uh, forms of ownership, there is, mm, what's this one? Uh, come on, I'm being blank. Uh, it's presentation. And uh, then the other one, I'll tell you when I think about it. All right, so in this lesson, uh, that's what we're going to do. So let's get started. Um, let me start by giving you sort of a background for the topic insurance right um this topic insurance first and foremost you need to know the basic principles of insurance and there are actually four we have utmost good faith we have uh, insurable interest then there's indemnity and then lastly there's security so you need to know this one then uh there are other terms or other important terms uh with regards to insurance uh, I'm not going to mention all of them because I probably won't remember all of them at the same time. Uh, there is um, subrogation, there is insured, there is insurer, there is premium, premium. Then there is access, uh, claim, uh, policy, and uh, come on, average close. And amongst the ones that I mentioned here, of course, you need to know what an insurer is, what an insured is, uh, you need to know subrogation and so on. But amongst these, the one of the most important that you need to know, because this one, they're always asking about it, average close. So you need to know what it is. Okay, I might as well just tell you. It is a stipulation set by the insurer and the insurer is the company um that uh, like insurance is the insurer right so it's a stipulation set by the insurer that that is applicable when property or goods are underinsured so they always the reason i'm saying you must know this one is it has appeared probably four or five times since 2017 so it's something that they always ask um and it always carries it's not just like they ask you to define no they ask you um, to identify uh, what the, the, the clause in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the extract, then when you'd say is the average clause, and then after that, uh, you might need to give motivation why you say it is. And uh, obviously your motivation will come from the fact that uh, the goods in the scenario have been underinsured. Right, then from there, you'd have to know insurable and non-insurable risk. There are certain things that can be, um, that can be insured and there, there are certain things that cannot be insured. Right, let's start with uh, insurable risks. Uh, under insurable risks, uh, we have, uh, should I give you examples? Uh, maybe not, uh, but we have things like theft. You know, you can insure your car against theft. Uh, storm you can insure your property or even your car there was a scenario in Pretoria um, a couple of years back where there was a storm in Pretoria East uh, and uh, around Mamilodi area and um, the likes of Ferry Glen I think up there so when that happened a lot of cars were hit by this <clears throat> by this hail storm and so I, I was surprised why is it that many cars nowadays they have holes because the hail it it really damaged the cars so they had like it's it looked like someone was hammering a car you know on the bonnets on the roof and on the boot because these cars had those holes as if someone was hammering so yes you can ensure your vehicle against storm and things like that but then you should know there is also what we call non-insurable risk, like certain things that you cannot really insure because uh, maybe, uh, you know, let's say something like a war, uh, civil unrest, you, you can't really like insure against war. Uh, it's something that insurance companies are not willing to take risk on. All right, then um, from there, you need to know types of insurance. 
Now, by types of insurance, we have compulsory insurance and non-compulsory insurance. And under compulsory insurance, we have UIF, Unemployment Insurance Fund. And um, you uh, under that, you need to know like uh, why one would have to claim uh, with UIF. That is when they become unemployed. So you have unemployment benefits there. You have um, maternity benefits that is uh, for pregnant women. And this one will last uh, four months, if I'm not mistaken. Then there's adoption benefits. You can claim UIF. And then there's dependent benefits. And then we have workman's compensation fund. It's a compulsory insurance. Then we have road accident fund. It's compulsory insurance. The reason these ones, we, we say they are compulsory is because we are contributing to these um, one way or the other. If you are employed, your employer will take will, will take UIF one uh, percent from your salary, and that goes to UIF. You have no choice there. When you buy petrol, part of that money that you pay goes to a road accident fund, and many people don't even know it that they are all contributing. So it's compulsory. Everyone contributes. No one like really complains. And so it, it's, it's what we refer to as compulsory insurance. Then we have insurance that is not compulsory. Uh, this is when, you know, you, you, you decide whether you want to take it or not. Uh, for instance, myself, yo, I think I should start insuring my vehicles or something like that because I don't have insurance at all. That sounds very, very weird, right? All right. Uh, why is it that I don't have it? Because I have a choice too. Or not to have it so we have fire insurance you can insure your house that makes sense uh, it's of course cars do burn but it's rare yeah you could insure your car against fire if you want remember this one is not compulsory you do it or you don't do it uh, theft insurance that is mostly common with you know vehicles uh, or even your 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 assets inside your house you can insure your TV against theft, anything, right? There is motor insurance, motor car insurance. You can insure your car uh, against anything, an accident or something like that. Storm damage, uh, I talked about this. Cash in transit insurance. Obviously, this one is needed by uh, those companies that transport cash because there are so many um, incidents of heists on the freeway and so on. Right, then there's fidelity insurance and then there's public liability insurance i don't know if i left out any of these so you should be able to distinguish between compulsory and non-compulsory insurance then there's another term uh, which is uh, assurance and and when we say assurance this is something that is definitely going to happen uh, it's different from uh, insurance because Insurance is something that may or may not happen. Like your car may be stolen, but it doesn't mean it will be stolen. It may not be stolen. Uh, but when when it comes to something like um, assurance, it's like a life assurance policy. It is definite that you are going to die. So you can, you can um, have insurance on that and we call it assurance because it's something that will definitely happen and then there's uh, retirement annuities uh, these uh, are, are long-term insurance and it's assurance as well because once you get once you start working there will be a time when you stop working so it's it's assured like you are not going to work forever obviously right then we have uh, endowment policy and uh, then that that is the last one and this one is mostly on it's it's more or less the same as a retirement annuities it's long term and um, it's uh, a fixed uh, it's for for mostly for a fixed period sometimes you'd find out that it could be five years ten years uh, or something like that uh, uh, but maybe just to find words to define it I'd say, wait, right, let me see how I can put it together. I can say it is a, a life insurance contract that is designed to pay a lump sum, like a large sum of money after a specific term or let's say at, at death when you die. 
so it typically can be 10 years 15 years 20 years so it is specific um and and obviously the the the, the maximum is your your like when you die so it is definite that five years will come 10 years will come 15 years will come you see so that's why it's part of life assurance um that's why we we put it under assurance because definitely it's going to happen so endowment policy retirement annuities and life assurance those three are examples of assurance policies the ones i gave you at first there are examples of insurance policies uh i'm not sure if i left out anything maybe yeah one other thing that i see is is most common they are asking a lot about benefits of insurance so make sure and this question when they ask it uh it'll be <clears throat> mostly something like 10 marks uh you know eight marks so make sure that you can uh come up with you know a list of benefits of insurance all right uh, i think this this is the first time i've ever done sort of a background um on a topic before we go to the questions all right so let's get started with the questions Right, the first question I have here is give five examples of long-term insurance. Uh, so you, you, you obviously thinking right now of examples and, uh, obviously you have endowment policy. It's the last one that I explained right now. You can see, I, I mentioned from five years, 10 years, 15 years, or when you die. So that is a good example of long-term insurance, uh, life cover policy or life assurance policy or life insurance. Uh, however you want to call it you can say life assurance and then retirement annuities so you see these three first and foremost um they are the ones that i mentioned to be assurance policies so uh they however are not the only examples of long-term insurance um so but but just not these three they are examples of assurance policies so in case they ask you to list any long to any assurance policies that you know but in that case they won't say five because uh even myself i'll be stuck on three i don't know if there's anything beyond this all right another one we have disability policy uh it can be long term and then there's trauma insurance and you you should notice that um a, a disability policy is something that may or may not happen like you might, you might become disabled. Um, you know, it's not something that is definite that you will become. So that's why we put them under. Um, yeah, then funeral insurance. That one will be uh, assurance because that will definitely happen. Then we have health insurance or medical aid. All right. We move on to the next question. Classify each statement below under compulsory or non-compulsory insurance. Uh, this one will be an easy one. Uh, Sam claimed from road accident fund for losing his arm in a road in a car accident. Uh, that one is obviously uh, compulsory. Uh, I mentioned it earlier that uh, when we buy petrol, we are all contributing to road accident fund. So that is compulsory. No one has a choice. You you can't say uh, please on my fuel don't charge me uh, road accident fund. That small percentage you can't tell them not to charge you so you know it is a must if it's either you buy petrol or you don't buy it but when you do you know and how about those people who don't uh, have cars why is it that they also benefit in car accidents because this um insurance covers everyone who's on public roads and in a way indirectly those people do contribute to petrol but they do it indirectly. Okay, let me give you an example. Uh, a taxi stops, it takes 15 people. The, the, the taxi driver's petrol is very, very low. And then he asks all, all of them to pay. And then now he has uh, 250 rands. Uh, then he pulls over at a petrol station. Uh, in a way, who, who bought this petrol? You see, it's the passengers. Because the, pet, the, the, the taxi driver himself didn't have money and he got the money from his passengers so now the the passengers are not buying petrol they are paying for the taxi fare but indirectly that money is then used to um 
to buy petrol. So they are also contributing to the fund. So that is why this thing covers everyone who's on public roads. So it covers pedestrians because a pedestrian will be hit by a car and that car has contributed to road accident fund. So the pedestrian deserves to be covered. That's, that's why it, it's compulsory. All right, you go manufacturers insured their workers against injuries and diseases um, that may occur, that may occur in the workplace. Okay, could this be uh, compulsory or non-compulsory? This happens to be compulsory. Right, um, which one could this be? Uh, okay, you know, we know, we all know COIDA, uh, Compensation of Occupational Injuries and Diseases Act. Right, um, Floyd Tiling in short, they are building against theft and fire. This one is non-compulsory because uh, you may insure your building against theft, you may not. Um, you may insure it against fire, you may not. It's all up to you. James claimed from the UIF, okay, that says everything. During the time that, so this one is compulsory, just the UIF part. Lisa insured her life against any event that may render her incapable to work. So this could be an accident. This could be something that like really claims a life. Okay, so could this be compulsory or non-compulsory? This is obviously non-compulsory because Lisa has no obligation to do this, but she does it because she wants to do it. She knows that these things may happen. And so, uh, you know, oh, by the way, a life, it ensures her life against okay so this will be when she does it will be life assurance okay then the next one uh insuring assets against theft de uh, damage fire and burglary before we move on number one this is insurable risk number two uh this is non-compulsory okay uh and burglary is essential for every business. Businesses should um, also plan carefully for risks uh, which are not insurable. That means the wars, civil unrest, things like that. Okay, so caught three examples of insurable risk from this scenario. Okay, this one, I, I don't know why they give such questions because it's, it's obvious, it's there. Um, unless if they had mixed, you know, like they talk about uh, insuring assets against theft, war, you see, that can be confusing at least. Because you are going to find learners who will say, oh, war. Uh, so if you get this one wrong, you just don't want to get it right. Because there's no way you can get this one wrong. Unless if they would try to confuse you a bit, they say against theft, war, damage, civil unrest, mix. Uh, insurable and non-insurable risk not just to put non-insurable uh, insurable risk and then you ask me to identify insurable risk it's there it's just smiling at me so there's no way i can get it wrong explain the term non-insurable risk and give one example uh, of such risk okay this one one could get it wrong because it's not in the scenario okay these risks are not insured by insurance companies as insurance costs or risk are too high so the insurance companies are sort of running away from this. Like uh, if there is going to be a war, it's going to destroy, you know, so that's going to be difficult. Examples, we have losses caused by war. We have uh, most, most um, risks occurring between placing orders and receiving goods. And then changes in fashion. Like you cannot ensure, let's say you are Mr. Price. And you have a lot of clothes in your shop and people have lost taste for those clothes. That means they are not buying them anymore. Then you go to your insurance company and claim that these clothes were not bought because people just don't like them anymore. So insurance companies don't take that risk. So if you are Mr. Price, you have to find ways to make sure that uh, you sell them before they go out of fashion. Uh, and you know, you know how they do it. They'll start putting them on special and yes, people come and buy at a cheaper price. 
moving on oh we still we we're still on the same question but a different uh re question okay advise businesses on the importance of insurance i mentioned this one okay it transfers the risk from the business or insured to an insure insurance company or insurer uh, this now you you may want to ask like so how does the insurance company benefit the insurance company benefits because uh, these things may or may not occur. So out of, let's say out of their thousand, uh, you know, clients, uh, only 20 claim. So they are just collecting premiums from the rest. So they're collecting premium from everyone and uh, accidents do happen to 20 or 50, even 100. That's not much. Uh, they're receiving premiums every month. And when this sort of thing happens, maybe you have been paying premiums for 10 years already. Uh, that's why I always find it difficult to have insurance because, but of course, I'm not running away from the fact that it's important. Uh, I had a bike that hit, a, a, one of my bikes, one of my drivers hit a, a car, a Mazda CX-5, and that car was like two weeks old. And it hit it from the back, it damaged it, the bumper. And they told me I have to pay 8,000. And since my bike was not insured, insured, I'm the one who was supposed to pay for that. So, you know, that's when you feel it that, oh, if I had insurance, uh, this would have been easier. But so yeah, it is what it is. Let's move on to the next one. It transfers uh, risk. Oh, transfer of risk is subject to the terms and conditions of the insurance contract and then protects the business against theft, loss of stock and or damages caused by natural disasters such as floods, storms and so on. The business will be compensated for insurable losses, e.g. destruction of property through fire. Business assets, e.g. vehicles, equipment, buildings need to be insured, insured against damages and or theft. Uh, businesses, a business is protected against the losses of earnings, the loss of earnings, e.g. strikes by employees, which result in losses worth millions, uh, and then protects the business against dishonest employees. Life insurance uh, can be taken on um, the life of partners in a partnership to prevent unexpected loss of capital. Should the services uh, of key personnel be lost due to accidents, death or, or death, the proceeds of an insurance policy can be paid out to the business or beneficiaries. Replacement costs for damage, uh, damaged machinery equipment or equipment are very high. Therefore, insurance can reduce or, or cover such costs. So all these are benefits to the business. Uh, protect a business from claims made by a member of the public for damages that the business is responsible for. And lastly, uh, protects the business against losses due to death of a debtor. That's true. Uh, we give someone a car. We uh, uh, Let's say we sell cars. We are demo cars. We sell a car to someone. They're using the car and then they get involved in an accident. They die in that car. So what happens now? That person is owing us. Okay, the good thing is uh, the, 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 this company will obviously have such insurance because they can't rely on the fact that, no, this person is gonna pay, this person is trustworthy. Of course, the person may be trustworthy, but now the person is dead. So who's gonna do it? The insurance company will then chip in and cover that. Right, discuss three types of benefits covered by uh, unemployment insurance fund. Okay, we mentioned these and uh, like, remember that time when we started, I said we have, uh, let me see if I remember, I said we have unemployment benefits, we have maturity benefits, adoption benefits, and what's the last one? Dependency, yes, dependency benefits. All right, so they want you to explain, discuss three types. Okay, so do you see what happens here for nine marks? In most cases, though, award two marks 
for you knowing that um, we have unemployment benefits. You get two marks for knowing that we have maturity benefits. You get two marks for knowing that there's adoption benefits. So it's important that you know just that for, for a start. Let's say you don't know how to explain any one of them. Already you have six marks in the bag. So you have six out of nine, it's not even bad. All right, so let's have a look. The first one is unemployment benefits. Like I said, you get your two marks there. Then you tell us what it is. Employees will become unemployed or retrenched due to restructuring or any reason. Uh, let's say their contract expired. These people are entitled because during the period that they were employed, they were contributing to UIF. And that was insurance that in case I get unemployed for any reason, uh, you know, I, I have the, the right to claim. So these people may claim within six months after becoming unemployed. So you get unemployed in December, uh, you have up to June the next year to claim. Right, uh, unemployed employees uh, may only claim if they contributed to UIF and in most cases they will have because it's compulsory. Right, unemployed uh, employees enjoy these benefits until the allocated funds are exhausted. And then if a worker voluntarily terminates his or her contract, he or she may not claim. Yes, you tell uh, the, the boss that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving then. Let's say you have an argument, then you just leave. Uh, that way you cannot claim. You must claim if something really happened. Like uh, let's say you were teaching economics and the school decided to phase out economics and now they don't have work for you. So now you become unemployed. In that case, you go and claim. And the last one, no tax is payable on unemployment benefits. Right, this, oh, are we going to the next one? Illness benefits. Employees may receive uh, these benefits uh, if they are unable to work for more than 14 days without, um, what do you call it? Without receiving a salary or part of the salary. Okay, this one illness benefit. I didn't mention it amongst the four that I had mentioned. Employees may not claim these benefits if they refuse medical treatment. The next one is maternity. I mentioned this one. Uh, pregnant employees receive these benefits for up to four consecutive months. Uh, if an employee has a miscarriage, uh, she can claim for up to six weeks or 42 days. Then we have adoption benefits. Employees may receive these benefits if they adopt a child younger than two years. Employees who take unpaid leave may receive part of their salary while caring for the child at home. Only one parent or partner may claim. So if your husband and wife, uh, of course, because one person could care for that child. So if you're a couple and you decide to adopt a child uh, who's six months old, and then the mother stays home taking care of the baby. Uh, we have um, uh, time to, you know, to claim for this one. All right, then we have dependents benefits. Dependents may apply for these benefits if their breadwinner who is who has contributed to UIF dies. So this will be something like uh, your children depend on you and now you have died. So they can claim with UIF because when you were employed, you were contributing to UIF. So the spouse of the deceased may claim whether he or she is employed or not. Uh, it is a good thing here. All right, key bed and breakfast. Insured their property for 600,000, but the property is valued at 800,000. So already before we go anyway, we can see where this is going. They're going to ask you about uh, the insurance close in most cases. I, I mentioned that make sure you know average close because, um, you know, amongst the things that I was mentioning there, that's when I said insured, insurer, and uh, other things, insurable risk and so on. I mentioned uh, this one, average close, uh, you know, you really have to know this one because I've noticed they like this question. All right, so fire destroyed po uh, part of the property and uh, damages amounted to 500,000. Okay, even though you insured 600,000, it doesn't mean uh, since you insured more than the damages, then they can give you because 
Uh, no. They look at the percentage of your insurance. Like you insured 60% or insured, <coughs> bless me, you insured what percent did you insure or did you insure of your property? Whatever damages, they'll pay you uh, uh, according to uh, the percentage that you insured. So this becomes very, very easy to, to calculate. All right. Identify the insurance close that will be applicable to this company here. That will be average close. Then calculate the amount. It's an easy calculation. You take the insured amount. So how much was insured? 600,000. You see like what I said, it's a percentage of, uh, so if you say 600 over 800 times the damage, that's the formula. In a way, what is 600 over 800, let's say times 100? It's the percentage. If you take the answer, zero point whatever, and you multiply it by 100, you get a certain percentage. Uh, that's, oh, you can do it right now. You can say 600 over 800 times 100. You get a percentage. You say that percentage times 500 is going to give you 370,000, definitely. But there's no need for you to do that. Uh, in the exam, you simply say 600 over 800 times whatever the damages are. Then you get this one. So this question, when it comes, you just know it's a free six marks because they'll ask you to identify the, the, the insurance close. After that, they'll ask you to calculate. I've seen it a thousand times. Right, state any four types of ins uh, unemployment insurance, UIF benefits. Okay, we did this unemployment, maternity, sick, adoption, and dependence. We've done this before, and it was that question for nine months, and you were supposed to explain each, and we have explained each. Initially, I had given you four, excluding the disability one. I mentioned adoption, I mentioned dependence, I mentioned maternity and unemployment. Right, identify the type of compulsory insurance applicable to each statement be below. Natalie broke her leg uh, when her car collided with another car and she is demanding compensation. So what type of insurance is this? This will be road accident fund. I mentioned it before because it's injuries that have been sustained on public roads. Right, Pete lost his job due to retrenchment. Okay, obviously, before I even finish, you can see what this is. And he's claiming compensation from the Department of Labor. This will be un Unemployment Insurance Fund. Right, and um, we don't have many examples of compulsory insurance. So it becomes too obvious what the answers are. Right, give three examples of insurable risk. Okay, these are the things that uh, insurance companies are willing to take risk over. So we had them, the likes of theft, burglary, uh, accidents, and so on. All right, so we have these ones, money in transit, fire, uh, natural disasters like storms, wind, rain, hail, damage to uh, loss of assets, vehicles, equipment, building, premises, and the last one, injuries on premises. Discuss any two principles of insurance. Okay, I gave you uh, these principles earlier uh, when, when, when I was introducing the topic. Uh, it hasn't come yet, but uh, I don't know if there are more than four, but I know four of them. There's utmost good faith, there's insurable, um, insurable interest, there's indemnity, and then there's security. All right, let's see which one we're starting with. Okay, we're starting with indemnity or indemnification. All right, what is this? Uh, this one usually applies to short-term insurance as the insured is compensated for specified or proven harm or loss. Okay, uh, insurer, ag insurer agrees to compensate the insured for damages or losses specified in the insurance contract in return for premiums uh, a premium is the payment that we made we make every month premiums paid by the insured to the insurer then prote protects the insured against uh, specified events that may occur payouts from insurance companies in or insurer will only be made if there is proof that the specified event took place 
if the insured can prove the amount of the loss or damage. The amount of indemnification of, or compensation, which is what the word indemnity means, is limited to the amount of provable loss or damage, even if the amount is um, in the policy or insurance contract is higher. And last but not least, the insured must be placed in the same position. By this, we mean that the insured must not benefit uh, or must not lose. Uh, in other words, what this means is if what you lost is worth 10,000, what they replace it with shouldn't be worth 12,000 or 8,000. Because if it's worth 12, so you are benefiting. If it's worth eight, so you are losing. So you must be put back to your original, you know, position. So the insured may not profit from insurance, right? The next one is um, security. Um, and this one is, uh, let's see, applies to long-term insurance where the insurer undertakes uh, to pay out an agreed upon amount in the event of loss of life. A, a predetermined amount will be paid will be paid out when the insured reaches a predetermined age or gets injured due to a predetermined period. Right, then aims to protect uh, to provide financial security to the insured at retirement or dependence of the deceased. Then we have utmost good faith. Uh, this one obviously is self-explanatory. Insured has to be honest. By this, it means you have to disclose everything. Uh, you know, let's say you go to insure a car and then uh, they ask you, they, they obviously have to know the value of the car. And if you don't mention things like um, your car was involved in an accident before, uh, because those things will affect the value of your car. So if you don't mention this, you are not being honest. So insured has to be honest in supplying details when entering in an insurance contract. But you know, people don't always do this. Both parties, the insured and insurer, um, must disclose all relevant facts. And the biggest culprit, I think, is the insured. No, 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 no. It's the insurer. These companies, insurance companies, yo, yeah, it's always a problem when it comes to paying. They always want to win. Okay, insured must disclose everything that may affect the, the extent of the risk. Yeah, uh, what I was saying is, uh, I remember a, a colleague of mine, Mem Sibanda, we were coming from work, so we're using her car, she was driving, and then um, a truck just turned in front of her. She honestly did nothing wrong. The truck just turned. It didn't indicate or anything. It just turned. So it turned and it hit her car. And so now the insurance company starts saying things like, uh, you, you have not been driving for long. Like you, but this lady has been driving for years. It's just that she's been driving in Zimbabwe and now her, her South African license is new, but then that doesn't say she's a new driver. Regardless, they didn't mention all these things when she entered into the insurance uh, contract. So she's been, they've been accepting her premiums. Now it's time for her to be compensated. They have stories. So it's true. These insurance companies, they always want to rip us off. And yes, I have noticed it firsthand. Right, then uh, details or information supplied when, when, um, when claiming should be accurate or true. Right, then we go to insurable interest. Insured must prove that he or she will suffer a financial loss if the insured object, uh, if the insured object is damaged, lost, or ceases ceases to exist. Let's say it burns to 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 to, to ashes, so it ceases to exist. Right, an insurable interest must be expressed in financial terms. That's true. Like there has to be an amount, and then insured. Insured must have a legal relationship with the insured uh, object in the contract. Yes, like you have to like truly own that thing. Right, then we move on to the next question. Jenny and John uh, auditors. Okay, 
insured their office building for 1 million rands, already I can anticipate where this is going. The market value of the building is 1.5 million. The building is damaged, uh, was damaged by floods. So they just changed the scenario here and the damages amounted to 80,000. They received compensation of 53,000 from the insurance company. Now identify the insurance clause applied by the insurance company. It's what is it boys and girls? We've, I've mentioned that this thing will always come and it comes a couple of times and your answer is always the same. It's average close. Elaborate on the meaning of, okay, so what is meant by this? Okay, a stipulation set by the insurer, which is applicable when property or goods are underinsured. Yes, I mentioned this. I even defined this when, when I started. The insurer will pay for insured losses or damages in proportion to the insured value. Exactly what I said. The percentage. If you insure your asset, 20% of your entire asset, when... You damages are worth 10,000, you get 2,000 because 2,000 is 20% of 10,000. So whatever, it's, it's proportional, okay? Uh, this means that the insured is responsible for a part of the risk that is not insured. Then outline two advantages of insurance for businesses. All right, this one, I mentioned that it will also come and I did it already. We did it, this one. So I'm not going to repeat it. All right. Okay. Then we move on to the next question. Give five examples of non-insurable risk. We say this over and over again. Uh, I, I mentioned war. Let's see change in fashion. I mentioned it. Improvement in technology. Okay. I didn't mention it, but yes, take note. Okay. But if you don't know, if you don't understand what this means, it's more like uh, you are using old technology and now there's new technology and so your your machinery is not going to to work anymore you have to like sell it or you know so they they are saying here insurance companies do not insure against improvement in technology so you you have to see it yourself that's simply what they say financial loss due to bad management uh possible failure of a business uh, shoplifting during business hours okay <laughs> but this one i thought it was insurable like people stealing uh, in your shop is it not like theft uh, okay so they are not referring to it as the theft so they are saying you must see this one for yourself okay that's weird imagine you are you insure your assets against theft and then they tell you no it was stolen during business hours so we don't insure this. This is common, let's say, in supermarkets. Someone walks in, takes something, puts it in the pocket and walks out. So the insurance company is not, it's saying, no, we don't want this kind of theft. We want when they break in at night and steal. Oh, okay. That's funny. Loss of income if stock is not received in time. Okay. Yeah, this one makes sense. Right, distinguish between insurance and assurance. The simple distinction is insurance may happen, assurance will definitely happen. Okay, based on the principle of indemnity, this one based on the principle of security or uh, certain, uh, certainty. Uh, the insured transfers the cost of potential loss. I, I thought we would start with this may happen, this may not happen. Okay, the insured transfers the cost of potential loss to the insured as at a premium and then on the other hand the insurer undertakes to pay an agreed sum of money after a certain period as has expired on the death of the insurer of the insured person whichever occurs first so obviously it will definitely occur it covers a specified event that may occur okay this is it specified events is event is certain that means this will definitely happen but the time of the event is unknown you will die we just don't know when i know someone who's scared of death all right applicable to short-term insurance applicable to long-term insurance examples we have property insurance money in transit theft burglary fire if you look at these examples these are insurable risk 
life insurance endowment policies um retirement annuities these are um, mostly what number one they are assurance policy okay everyone knows that but number two everything here all these examples we have they are insurable risk because you can insure these things non-insurable risk is things that we cannot insure against we talked about this and on the other hand uh if you look at life insurance and so on these ones are long term if you look at those other ones uh they we don't like list them as long-term insurance trade uh top traders bought stock worth four hundred thousand, but insured three hundred thousand. that means uh average close a fire in the warehouse destroyed the stock to the value of sixty thousand. so name the that's average close calculate that simple same formula 300 over 400 times 60,000 is 45,000. So the damages are worth 60,000. The insurance company pays you 45,000. Discuss the advantages of none. Oh, sorry, this one shouldn't be there. All right, so it brings us to the end of uh, insurance. Uh, thank you so much, uh, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for, for watching. And uh, please be sure to subscribe. Uh, as I'm doing this video, I've reached 900 subscribers. Uh, I need 100 more. Please subscribe. Thank you so much. Your support.